Welcome to today's joint CG and CSHE webinar and book symposium. My name is William Locke and I am director of the Centre for the Study of Higher Education at the University of Melbourne and one of the three editors of the book we are launching today. The other editors are Simon Margeson at the University of Oxford, director of the Centre for Global Higher Education, who will speak after me and Claire Callender, OBE, Deputy Director of CG and Professor of Higher Education at both UCL and Birkbeck in London. Before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, which is Bayside in Melbourne, the land of the Boonwarung people of the Kulin Nation, as well as the traditional owners of the land you are situated on, if you're in Australia, that is. And I acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. We held a launch seminar for the book in September at a time that was convenient for participants in Europe and east, the east coast of North America. Uh, a recording of that is available on the CG website, but I thought it would be nice to organize a webinar for those in Eastern time zones and featuring those chapters authors based in China and Australia. Uh, thanks to our publisher, Bloomsbury, who are offering a 35% discount on their Australian website. A link to the discount flyer, which should include the code GLRTW6, will be posted on the chat facility, I think, at the bottom of your screen at some stage. Let me run through the protocols for today's webinar. Um, so the webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted online on both the CG and CSHE websites in due course, usually in a couple of days. Uh, only the presenter's microphones uh, can be unmuted and video shared. So if you wish to ask a question, please use uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please post your question there uh, at any time from now onwards, to be honest. Um, you can remain anonymous if you wish. Uh, the panel will answer your questions once all the presenters have spoken. And a copy of all the questions that are posted will be uh, accessible from those websites as well, alongside the video. video. So that's the admin out of the way. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll hand over to Simon Marginson. Well, thank you, William. Um, and since uh, November 2015, uh, CG has been researching the main issues and emerging trends in higher education in the UK and abroad, um, including the growth of participation, student learning, new private sector providers, uni university industry links, higher education governance, the academic profession, international students and migration policy, the public good role of higher education, social equity in higher education, sustainable financing and tuition loans, graduate labour markets, and of course, digital applications to higher education. And most of these issues have been uh, brought forward again for us by the pandemic, um, and all of them feature in our book. The Research Centre draws on the insights of researchers in the UK, United States, Australia, Ireland, China, Hong Kong, Japan, South Africa, and the Netherlands, including postdoctoral and doctoral scholars who will be tomorrow's research leaders in the field. After the introductory chapter on the role of higher education and uh, William Locke's excellent chapter two on the need for an evidence-based approach to the future of the sector, which does a masterly job in skewering the fake futurologists and alarmists, the book chapters fall into five parts. Part one on global, in, global factors in higher education concerns the uneasy tectonics when the national and global planes of action meet. Chapter three looks at the expansion of global science. It shows that while the globalization of trade, investment and production have faltered and US appreciation of the value of China seems to have deteriorated, global cooperation in science is resilient and dynamic. Chapter four, examines the collision between incoming student mobility and migration resistance in the UK. And chapter five highlights the shock of Brexit 
in the UK higher education sector, which has been profoundly engaged in Europe. Part two focuses on financing and widening participation and chapter six on income contingent tuition loans financing will be introduced today by Bruce, Lorraine and Zung. Chapter seven by Claire and colleagues reviews the research on the longer term effects of student debt. Chapter eight by Vicky Bolivar and colleagues critically discusses efforts to widen the social base of participation in England, the equity issues. Part three, on teaching and learning starts with chapter nine by Paul Ashwin on the principles underlying national system wide approaches to teaching excellence. And in chapter 10, Jan MacArthur reflects on the power of assessment to shape student learning, including learning about social justice in disciplinary frameworks. Dinah Lorillard and Eileen Kennedy, chapter 11, discusses the potential of massive open online courses, or as you know, MOOCs to widen access to professional education and orchestrate collective knowledge development in professional communities. In part four, Francis Green and Golo Henseki provide a state of the art journey down the path of graduate employment and underemployment, an issue which will become very major as we move through the pandemic and into the next period. In part five on institutions and markets, Yanya Komolgenovic uh, talks about devices used in making higher education markets, such as the Students as Consumer Reform in the UK and international student recruitment agencies. And Stephen Hunt and Vicky Bolivar in chapter 14 ask whether subsidised private colleges in the UK can break into the educational mainstream. They say that probably no. The final part six, is on the public and social benefit of higher education. And in chapter 15, Paul Ashwin and Jenny Case reflect on their large participative research project on student and graduate pathways in South Africa. Tian Lin and Liu Nian Kai will today discuss their chapter 16 on the public good role of universities in China. And the final chapter by myself reviews the concepts of public and common good and outlines a framework for researching all of the contributions of higher education. CG research compares higher education's contributions to public good in Japan, China, Korea, Finland, France, Poland, UK, US, Canada, and Chile. Well, now I'll hand you back to Claire. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, delighted, first of all, to introduce um, our, first, our next set of speakers, and that is um, Bruce Chapman, who um, is the Sir Ronald Wilson Chair of Economics in the College of Business and Economics at ANU. And Bruce has worked for many years with Lorraine Dearden on higher education finance and specifically income contingent loans. And Lorraine, who will be giving the presentation, um, is the Professor of Economics and Social Statistics at University College London and Research Fellow at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. And they're also joined today by Zung Don, who is a Research Fellow at the um, uh, Research School of Economics at ANU and who's been working with both Lorraine and Bruce. So we welcome you all and over to you, Lorraine. Um, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, and thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak about the chapter which Bruce Zung and I have written. And it's about the income contingent loan revolution that has uh, taken place over the last 30 years and started with Bruce's um, in, uh, wonderful involvement in the design of HEX in, for Australia in the light, late 1980s. So um, the chapter begins by talking about student loans over time and points out that the first national student loan um, uh, actually took place in Colombia 
and it's coming up to the 50th anniversary to when the first national uh, student loan scheme was introduced in 1951 in Colombia. And that's sort of quite poignant, actually, because Bruce and I are now currently doing a lot of work with Colombia on their student loan design. But um, income contingent loans were initially introduced in countries where there was no fees. So we go back to Australia in 1988, and I was actually working in the Department for Education in Canberra when Bruce was uh, designing this. And Australia, as we most of this audience will realize had no fees and Bruce was charged with a, the, the, the assignment of trying to come up with a system whereby they could expand higher education access, which was very limited at the time, only around just over 10% of people went to higher education, how they could expand it in an affordable way without uh, impacting on access. And so Bruce's wonderful solution was income contingent loans where students didn't have to pay fees up front. So fees were introduced to help cover the cost of university, but students didn't have to pay these fees up front. They could get an income contingent loan and then repay the loan according to how much they earned. So they only paid back a proportion of their income. If they're unemployed, if they had bad luck in the system, in, in the economy, they paid nothing. And this started uh, income contingent loans being introduced in other countries, again, where there was no fee. So, uh, so New Zealand two years later, and then in um, the United Kingdom in the late 1980s. And it's been introduced in other countries as well. And it's completely transformed the way that higher education operates in those countries. So in the UK, for example, where I'm based now, there's been a huge expansion of higher education. And this has been made possible by introducing fees, providing more resources to fund a larger higher education in, uh, 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 sector, and but ensure that there's no upfront costs, particularly for those from poor socioeconomic backgrounds. And in the UK, the biggest expansion has been from uh, students from the poorest socioeconomic background. Okay, but in the majority of other countries, um, it's changing, but most countries like the US, like Canada, uh, like uh, 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 most of the, virtually all of the countries in Latin America where I've been working recently, they do not have income contingent loans. They have time-based repayment loans, which are like a mortgage. So a student goes to university in the US, they have a debt, and then they have to repay their loan over a set period with equal installments over that set period. That means that if they have bad luck, they lose a job, they've got to find the money from somewhere. And this causes huge hardship and means that there's very high levels of default. And you can imagine in the current context where, where there's a pandemic and unemployment's gone through the roof, this is creating huge problems. So we document in the chapter sort of why an income contingent loan can work in most of these countries. So, so Bruce and I with other colleagues in the US and, and Nick Barr at LSE have designed, shown that an ICL can work in the US. Zung has done work in Vietnam. Uh, Bruce and I were also involved in Malaysia. We're, as I said, currently involved in Chile. You can design income contingent loans, which will stop these default problems and are also sustainable. But in other countries, the big problem is, you know, if you lose your job, the repayment burdens are just so excessive, the, job, the, the, the loan scheme simply is not sustainable. The other huge advantage which income contingent loans have is that the way they are collected is through employer withholding, through the tax system in Australia and the UK. And this is incredibly efficient. So, you know, in the US, they have private companies chasing students who do not 
pay their loans and you know that the consequences of not paying your loan is is tremendous you could it, it it's changes your life forever it ruins your credit reputation you cannot get a loan uh you cannot declare bankruptcy with a student loan in the us and it it, it causes misery with an income contingent loan the way you solve that is by giving students who have bad luck much much longer to pay their loan and it means that the government in the end will recover more there will never be hardship for students and you can design the loans to fit the public policy agenda they can involve big subsidies like in the uk there's a 45 percent subsidy with a student loan or no subsidies the income contingent loan introduced in japan has none and as to finish up so so we we're doing lots of work in countries we're working in colombia at the moment and show that an income contingent loan is viable there and it's particularly poignant at the moment with the pandemic in australia the uk graduates like my eldest son who has just graduated might be fa facing lots of problems getting a job but the one thing they do not have to worry about is their student loan he does not have a job he is paying nothing back on his student loan so i'll leave it there and uh, um, i'm sure people will have questions and um, bruce and zun can uh, uh, chime in then so thank you Lorraine, thank you very much. Um, if we uh, wanted uh, some testimony as to why Lorraine, Bruce and Dong are world experts in this area, all we have to do is listen to Lorraine and read their chapter. So thank you very much indeed. Um, so let's move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Mian Liu, who's Professor and Dean of the Graduate School of Education at Shanghai Sha Tong University and Lin Tian, who is a PhD student working alongside Nian. So um, we welcome this next presentation where the focus is on China. Thank you very much indeed. Over to you. Um, thank you, Claire, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to make an introduction of our chapter, chapter 16, to all of you. My name is Ling Tian. I come from Shanghai Jiao Tong University as a CG research assistant. And also, uh, on behalf of my supervisor, Professor Liu, um, so I'm going to give you a brief introduction today. According to the title of this chapter, you may consider it focuses more about common good and higher education. But actually, this chapter reviews both common and public goods in higher education in China. So first, our chapter gives definitions of both key concepts, but I'm not going to talk too much about them at this point because I will discuss them in combination with our research findings later. So first, I'll show you some background information about higher education in China. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China in the year 1949 until the reform and opening up in 1978, we see a period of big government and no market under the planned economy. Higher education in this period was fully controlled and funded by the Chinese government without charging any tuition fee from the students. So it was a pure public good at that time. Later, from 1978 to 1992, private higher education emerged during this period, and higher education was shifting from a pure public good to a quasi-public good in China. Later, from 1992 until now, under the influence of the market economy, we see the period of big government and new market so during this period, both private and public institutions began to charge some tuition fees from students, and the students themselves competing fiercely with each other for places at best Chinese universities. So um, at this moment, higher education in China is more like a quasi-public good. So this is the evolution and the development of Chinese higher education related to the idea of public good 
And you may consider that um, the idea of public good took a dominant role in the history of Chinese higher education. Yes, actually, that's right, because we can also see this from the previous Chinese studies. As you can see here, the Chinese, study, um, the Chinese scholars began to study public good and higher education since 1998, and their focuses change along with the time. But in comparison, their studies on common good and education, uh, not about uh, higher education, but more general education, started only after UNESCO's report in the year 2015, rethinking uh, education towards a global common good. Okay, so based on this, as part of a 10 CG research project focusing on higher education and the public good, our research mainly focuses on the following three questions. First, what is the relationship between government and higher education in China? Second, how does, edu how does education in China relate to public good? And third, how does higher education in China relate to common good? We use semi-structured interviews to get data and a total of 24 Chinese participants were interviewed, uh, including government officers, university leaders, as well as the uh, university academics. Okay, then I'll show you some key points from our research findings. The first, um, first is about the relationship between government and higher education. According to our research findings, Higher education in China is shaped, guided, and largely financed by the Chinese government. So government plays a dominant role in the higher education system, and it, will, it is also the primary financial supporter for public universities. As you may know that the higher education system in China mainly consists of public universities. Interviewees in this study consider that this kind of relationship is positive and effective. Given that the complex situation in China, despite that, interviewees in this study still believe that universities need their own independent judgment. Okay, then it's about higher education and the public good in China. Here you can see our study gives definitions as well as differentiation between the public good and the public goods in higher education. First, let's look at the public good of higher education. This means that higher education is not only for individuals, but also for the general public, emphasizing the intrinsic value and attribute of higher education itself. So it's a more generalized idea when compared with public goods, because public goods refer to more specific activities and practices on a non-profit basis in higher education. In terms of level and scope, we have a differentiation between local and global public goods here. And next point is about higher education in China is not a pure public good because it is free charging and selective but its public nature has been maintained due to the Chinese national policy as well as the Chinese culture. Um, last, the private and the public goods of higher education in China can grow together, which means there's no zero sum relationship between public and private goods in higher education in China. Okay, then it's about higher education and the common good in China. Here you can say common goods or the common good may be confined to a certain group and their creation and the production are processes of collective participation. This means common goods emphasize the shared action, collective endeavor, and the collective participation. Um, this is in contrast with uh, public goods because public goods are open to free riding. Free riding. Okay, then very similar to global public goods, we have global common goods and global common good here. Both of them are related to all people worldwide. For example, global mobility, research and knowledge can also be regarded as global common goods. Okay, then interviewees in this study consider that 
um, the concept of a community of shared future for mankind, we call it as Renlei命运共同体 in Chinese, is very similar to the idea of the common good because this idea emphasizes the interdependence and convergence among um, different countries. Okay, last but most important, though higher education in China is largely government-led and regulated, its contribution to the individuals, the society, and the whole nation receive wide attention. In China, it has been, it is a collective endeavor, and it is also common to all people. Apart from this, based on my previous slides, higher education in China is neither a pure public good nor a pure private good, so it would be more reasonable and comprehensible to define it as a common good. And also, that's also uh, why we titled this chapter as Higher Education in China, Rethinking It as a Common Good. Okay, so um, that's all for the introduction of chapter 16. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Lian, Lin. Uh, that, that was absolutely uh, fascinating and um, I think raises lots of interesting issues and observations for countries outside of China too. So finally, um, I'd like to um, uh, hand over to William. Um, all of you know William Rock and who moved from sunnier climes um, and is now Professor and Director of the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education at Melbourne. We miss you, William, but... Um, <laughs> So, so um, you're Australia's gain. Um, Thank you. And, uh, to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire. A screen up. Okay. So uh, first, I should point out that this chapter obviously was written before the pandemic. Um, so uh, I will return to that topic though at the end of what I've got to say. However, um, it's impossible to do justice to a chapter in just a few minutes, so I'll try to summarize my argument for you on this slide. Um, some influential versions of the future of higher education, including from management consultants, thought leaders and journalists, are dangerous because they, are large, they largely ignore research and evidence on emerging trends, play on the fears of policy makers and sector leaders, predict disruptive change, undervalue universities' capacity to innovate and initiate change, and so limit options and future directions. The factors they identify are not in themselves unworthy of investigation, but it is the way they are combined to suggest uh, cataclysmic upheaval that is problematic. They do this so as to position, position themselves to advise higher education institutions on how to respond to the supposed disruptions in a deliberate attempt to generate business, create publicity, and exert influence. And I'm focusing mainly on the management consultancies in this chapter, Ernst & Young, KPMG, PA Consulting, PwC, and so on, but also some influential think tanks such as the American Council on Education and the UK Institute for Public Policy Research. So let's look at the methodology they, they adopt. So they selectively draw on interviews and surveys of university heads, usually uh, thought leaders and senior policy makers and key stakeholders. They very rarely seek, however, the views of staff and students working and studying in higher education institutions. They hardly consult existing research and almost exclusively cite previous management consultancy reports, often their own, uh, policy documents and indeed newspaper articles. They recycle myths and folklore that do not really stand up to empirical scrutiny. They tend to generate a self-perpetuating dialogue and discourse about cataclysmic change and the need for radical transformation. And this futurology circulates among influential networks and begins to inform current strategy making within institutions and policy making at state, national and global levels. So I'm arguing that it should not simply be dismissed as speculative marketing but evaluated as a discourse which actually has influence and material impact on behavior and decision making. So what are the common disruptors that these futurologists talk about? Well, first of all, the transformation of graduate work. And we're talking here about automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, and so on. And those requiring different kinds of intellectual work, problem solving, and creativity. We talk about students changing characteristics and expectations, and in particular, 
their supposed facility with technology and with social media. They talk about reduced government funding and deregulation when the evidence is suggesting that reduced funding is more often associated with increased rate regulation. And so they are looking at this through a rather neoliberal lens. They talk a lot about increased use of top technology in all aspects of university operations, not just in teaching and learning, but also in research and the back office, as they would call it. And they talk about the growing competition from private universities, particularly for-profit colleges and universities. Again, looking at this from a kind of neoliberal lens. Um, so in terms of the scenarios of the future, uh, each of these external drivers is, is claimed to be significant in itself, but it's actually the way in which they're combined which makes them irresistible. So, for example, changing student characteristics will be a catalyst for the adoption of new technologies or reduced government funding will force higher education institutions to work and partner more closely with industry. And so, I would argue it's not it is this mutual reinforcement that heralds a crisis that is claimed to render the legacy models of universities redundant. I think it's a, quite a seductive narrative, uh, a persuasive discourse. It partly draws on the contributions of some institutional and sector leaders and replays these back through a particularly narrow lens. Uh, it uses surveys and interviews of these leaders and selected quotations usually used simply to support their argument it reinforces some of the dominant assumptions and folklore about such things as industrial relations, in higher education, silo mentalities, linear academic careers, and academics' attitudes towards business. Uh, and these are used to make the point that universities are somehow anachronistic, the legacy of a bygone era. We can all recognize elements of this, but it's the way in which the narrative is built that is so persuasive. And while claiming to stimulate discussion, that's always what they say in their reports uh, and debate, it turns out that it turns these into seductive and selective narratives about future developments in higher education that are aimed at creating an agenda for transforming current thinking and practices and existing endeavors. And rather like rankings, this futurology was almost designed to generate anxiety amongst university leaders and a desire to make change happen. So in conclusion, we need uh, a much more accurate analysis of the current environment for higher education based on the best research evidence and analysis of trends in the recent mid and long term past. And I believe this should include rigorous analysis of existing examples of effective and successful practice that could offer embryonic illustrations of developments for the future. And I think the European Union sponsored Universities of the Future program and also University of Lincoln's uh, 21st Century Lab, University of Lincoln in the UK. A 21st century lab thinking ahead are two good examples of this. We need more evidence-based and iterative approaches which can ensure that we evaluate the full range of factors that are involved in this, not just the economic and the technological, but the social and the political and the legal. And we can then avoid more, the more reductionist approaches that privilege particular activities um, and deterministic assumptions and prioritize specific outcomes. So finally then, is the pandemic the ultimate disruptor? It's certainly providing plenty of grist for the futurologist's mill. We're told these are unprecedented times, and indeed it's rare that the higher education sector as a whole contracts and so many individual universities are downsizing. But there are and have been disruptions before. There have been wars and civil wars, nationalist movements, invasions, mass migrations, all of which have seriously impacted on universities before. And there have been retrenchments in the past. Following the financial crisis of 2008-9, there was a contraction in many national higher education systems with staff moving to shorter working weeks and taking pay cuts in exchange for job security. There was voluntary and compulsory redundancy schemes and so on. We're also told that there will be no return to the old normal. Um, but most universities are actually concerned with survival at the moment in the short to medium term and not really altering their business models and modus operandi too much for fear of collapse. When universities had the money to innovate, they felt they didn't need to, but now they, when they need to innovate, they don't have the money. They don't have the funds to invest in innovative change management. And maybe a crisis is not a good time to start making a new strategy because the future is even more unpredictable 
than during normal times. And of course, none of this is very good for the management consultants who will suffer as a result of the contraction of universities' finances and from retrenchment. And they, they have actually all, already let a number of higher education specialist consultants go. But I doubt this will be the last we hear of these dangerous futurologies. Thanks for listening. Well, thank you very much. Um, William. Now it's over to you. Um, we have some questions um, and please uh, uh, add more questions to the Q&A. Um, so first of all we have a question from Peter Robinson. Peter, um, would you like to ask your question? I don't think you can actually. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so Peter, um, I thought that um, um, Simon would like to address Peter's question. Simon, over to you. You want to read out the question and then comment on yes. it? Yes. Yes, Peter's asking us um, about, the, about the higher education form, you know, whether it's still relevant. Um, his question is, uh, with the significant growth in online learning opportunities offered by providers other than universities and a growing interest in micro-credentialing as an alternative to the basic three or four year undergraduate degree, uh, where's university educators becoming less relevant to the labor market needs of the world we now live in? Um, are we on the precipice of no longer being relevant since we continue to enmesh ourselves in a model of learning that is transmissive rather than experiential and in an industrial age organizational form? Well, this actually goes to the issues that William raises, I think, in chapter two, but we've had a chance to test some of this in the pandemic period. Now, my impression, and it is early days, I mean, it's only, we're only, you know, a little over half a year into COVID-19 era, which is clearly going to run for two or three years. Um, I mean, my impression, though, is that the, the traditional university form has proved very robust um, the message we're getting all over the world is that students don't want to just be online. There's no particular enthusiasm for credentials that are shorter than the full length degree. And I, one of the reasons for that is that the continued model of course retains status. Uh, the, the full degree in um, established institutions with reputations plays better when you apply for a job than a shorter course or a course that was solely online and so on. So, I mean, that status uh, aspect is quite a break on the sort of dis the notion of debundling or disintegration of the traditional model. Um, the, but um, I suppose the, the, the sort of larger question that, that Peter is also pointing to is the knowledge-based approach versus the experiential or uh, practical approach to learning and to preparation. And this is an old debate. I mean, of, all, of the great educational philosophers, I think it was really John Dewey who, and, and C.P. Mead in the US, who especially emphasized that, that learning is experiential in character and that exposing students of all ages to a, a succession of, ex, of formative experiences was part of that process. But I mean, Dewey and Mead also said that that doesn't obviate the need to enter into discourse, enter into knowledge, whether it's science or it's history or it's, or it's anthropology or some other field, that students need to immerse themselves in complex linguistically based and quantitatively based knowledge. Um, and that I think is at the core of the university project. And while, that, while societies continue to uh, prepare people for living and working in terms of complex knowledge, um, then the present form of higher educa education will survive. If we switch into another kind of world in which people acquire knowledge you know, as information online or and, and, and their um, preparation is entirely practical, um, then of course we'd be in the territory that Peter's pointing us to, but my impression is that we are not there yet. Can I just add? Yeah, yep. go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question, and it's of course a question the futurologists that I mentioned have asked. Um, and I think before the pandemic, I think many people would have been surprised at how quickly 
many universities have managed to transfer their teaching and learning online. Now it's not perfect by any means, um, but I think it's been a bit of a surprise that people have been able to do that so quickly. I think what, it, what it's missing at the moment is that whole social element, that experiential social element of higher education. And it's going to take a while to be able to replicate that online and maybe never possible. Um, and I think uh, you're right, um, Simon, to, to remark that many, many students, although they've appreciated the effort that's been put into putting their uh, teaching and learning online by, by staff, by academics and professional staff, um, they are missing out on that social aspect, especially, especially if they've already experienced some of that on campus and they are looking forward to coming back on campus. And let's not forget that many people um, go to university in order to move countries and maybe end up living in that country or certainly working in that country after graduation. That's, what they're, that's one of the opportunities they're looking for. Um, and it's, uh, it, it would, would be almost impossible to, to uh, replicate that uh, in, with a, in a purely online environment. Thank you, William. Okay, we have two questions from John Chu um, for Bruce and Lorraine. So the first question is, to what extent is the design of an income contingent loan dependent on the integration with the tax system in order for it to function effectively? And um, the second question is, are you seeing any opportunities or gaps or examples whereby income contingent loans could play a role in the funding of global student mobility? So I don't know, Lorraine, do you want to start? And then Bruce can come in, please. Yep, sure, I, I, I can start. Um, every country is different, actually. Uh, um, and I, maybe I could give an example of Colombia where I'm working currently. So, so Colombia is a middle income country in Latin America, and they've got a huge problem with their student loan system. As I said, it was the first student loan system ever operating. And the big concern is that of the informal labor market, could you implement a scheme like this with such a big informal labor market? Well, the one huge, it, uh, advantage we have in Colombia is they've got fantastic data. So we know every single person who, who's taken out a loan in Colombia since 2003, and we've been able to link it to their social security contribution. So anybody in the formal labor market makes a social so security contribution for health and pensions in Colombia. So it is true, even amongst graduates at any one time, around 30% are not in the formal labor market. So you might worry, could an income contingent loan work? However, if you look, we've got the data over 10 years between 2009 and 2020. Over that period, around 95% of graduates have been in the formal labor market. And you can see that an income contingent loan would work. So it's very country specific. And so in Colombia, they wouldn't do it through the tax system. They'd do it through the social security system. Um, I know Bruce, has got, Bruce might want to come in, but in other countries, it depends what the graduate labor market is. It, in a lot of countries, developing countries, the graduate labor market is very much focused on people working in the public sector. That makes designing an income contingent loan uh, uh, possible. You know, until you go to the country, until you look at the data, until you, you know, uh, 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 work it out, it, 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 it's hard to say. But I have not yet been to a country. We went to Malaysia, got some fantastic data. Again, they were worried about the informal labour market. You could show it was not going to be a problem. Zung might be able to talk about Vietnam, Bruce about other countries. But... I'm yet to come up with an example where you couldn't design an income contingent loan that would be better than the current loan system operating. Yeah. I, uh, could I add to that? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The critical point is not the integration with the tax system as such. The critical point is what Lorraine referred to in her talk. It's employer withholding, which means that the employer takes a certain proportion of income out of salary and then gives it to the government, just as they do with income tax and in some countries such as the UK, 
and the US uh, Social Security. So you don't actually need the tax system. I think it's a good idea to have the tax system because of the, of the engagement of the tax system with employer withholding, but also to pursue, if you like, um, the self-employed. But the countries that do this best, Australia, New Zealand, England, all use employer withholding, and other countries have tried to do it without employer withholding, such as Hungary, and then they've got a version of this system in the United States, whereby they look at the previous year's tax returns, and I think that's a very bad idea, because it's not contemporaneous, it's not efficient. So the critical point is that just about every country in the world, all the countries I know of, have some form of employer withholding. And it's even true for countries with big informal sectors. The reason it's not a big issue that Lorraine's Colombian data show us is that most of the graduates actually work in the public sector. They're teachers, they're nurses, they're doctors, they're administrators. They're people who are basically subjected to employer withholding anyway. So that's, that's the trick. And uh, countries that try to collect without employer withholding have terrible problems. And that is the most important single aspect of the public sector administration. The second part of the question is, the second question, this is a tough one. Will it ever be all around the world? It's not going to happen unless countries individually are collecting income contingent loans through employer withholding. You can't come to some agreement with a country that doesn't do this because it'll be anathema to them. It'll be, you know, like trying to communicate with a Martian. It won't work. Um, so I, I am not all that optimistic that there will be a universal income contingent loan until many more countries have got their own systems. Some countries are on the verge and maybe within about four or five years, there'll be over a dozen, um, but that's not the whole world. Great, thank you very much. Zong, do you want to add, um, Zong, do you want to add anything? Um, thanks, Claire. I think Bruce and Lorenz has covered all that I want to say. Great, okay. So um, on the, the Q&A, we have a question about the impact of, um, the impact of COVID on the monopoly of public universities um, on awarding uh, degrees. Um, uh, and I wonder whether, um, Lynn, um, you, you could address that question, um, the extent to which COVID may reduce um, the, um, or eliminate the monopoly of public universities that they have on awarding degrees. I mean, it, it isn't actually the case that, that they don't the um, public universities um, can award deg degrees, um, I assume, in China. But perhaps you can help explain that and, and respond to that issue, Lynn. Thank you. OK, thank you, Claire. Uh, and uh, I would like to repeat this question again. Uh, will the current disruption due to the COVID likely to reduce or eliminate the monopoly public universities have on awarding degrees? Um, I think probably yes, um, especially in the context um, under the background of um, the global common good, because that would be um, like a balanced role between the public institutions and the private institutions. And especially for the private institution, there will be like more opportunities for providing distance or online learning and more flexible degrees in these universities because especially um, in China or the Central European countries, uh, private universities like um, uh, they often have more like opportunities to set these classes when compared with public universities because they are um, more government led, I think. So uh, yes, uh, the, the answer is yes. Thank you. Nian, do, do, do you want to add in? Yeah, thank you, Claire. Uh, I think uh, yeah, there, will, there will be some uh, influence, but uh, very limited, I would think. Because uh, uh, as a matter of fact, in China now, the pandemic is, 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 is not there anymore. There is some uh, uh, occasions, but uh, very few. 
So uh, we are free to, to travel in China. All the universities become uh, the new normal, I would say, the new normal. Students are advised not to travel too much during the vacation days. They, they, they are allowed to travel, but they have to report where to travel. So it, it more or less is the new normal. There's not much change or not much influence on Chinese university, I mean, the pandemic, the COVID. So at least for, for the China, for Chinese higher education, uh, the, the influence is limited. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I'd like to now ask Simon to address the question, which is a really interesting one, whether as a result of the fact that we have globalization, whether we're likely to see very particular university associated schools of thought, such as the Frankfurt School. So Simon, can I ask you to address that question? Yeah, and say, and let me say hello to Lin Nguyen because she's a participant in our global webinar series, which we run Tuesdays and Thursdays. She's always there and a very thoughtful contributor. Um, I hope your doctoral examination goes well late, uh, this, year, late, late this year, I think, isn't it, Lin? Um, well, I think that we have got cross-country um, schools of thought, if you like, or, or, and, and in some cases, critical centres. It's been a feature of the European experience uh, through the common European funding programs that, that large groups, medium-sized groups have come together over the years and become very coherent and, and important in, uh, in their own different disciplines and fields. I think we see more of that kind of cooperation in the natural science-based disciplines than we do in the social sciences. My sense is that the social sciences are still largely nationally nested, surprisingly so, but uh, amongst the peak scholars and, uh, and researchers in the social sciences, there's tremendous international cooperation and appreciation of each other's work. Uh, the, uh, the kind of um, uh, Frankfurt School type development, I think is a product of a particular period in history. Um, whether the, the, the turmoil of the times that we're now seeing is giving rise to new kinds of intellectual cooperation or formation remains to be seen. A lot of things are still centered on the United States um, and, uh, and, and the great American um, think tanks and institutions are often you know, the, the leaders in, the, in this respect. But you think of the New School in New York, for example. But um, I mean, a, big, a big question for us is whether the emerging Cold War, um, as it's now been called officially, more or less, by the Financial Times in the UK, is, is going to, uh, the Cold War between the United States government and China, um, and I use those two terms carefully, um, with the US sort of targeting China, you know, as a nation, its people, its, its, its individual scientists and, and scholars and so on. Um, you know, whether that's going to lead to a disruption of the potential co for cooperative thought. Uh, I think a really important issue there is whether uh, we can do what, uh, what Lind referred to as maintain the independence of universities so that even apart from what their governments might be saying to each other, that they're continuing to exercise their institutional autonomy and academic freedom and, and work together across the, the barriers that are developing. Really important that scholars and scientists and students retain their academic freedom and their institutional autonomy and cooperate. Great, thank you very much, um, uh, Simon. Um, William, um, can you now please address uh, Anne's question, which is focusing specifically on Australia? I'm just reading it. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, do you want to read it out for everybody? Okay, I will do. Uh, so it's addressed to Simon and myself. Um, given the Australian government's lack of financial support for universities through the funding schemes such as JobKeeper, uh, this is a bit like the furlough scheme in the UK. Um, partly potentially due to the perception that universities are indep independently wealthy, despite the severe reduction in international student enrollments and hence essential revenue leading to likely loss of 20,000 jobs across the sector. Would it be fair to say universities are seen as elitist and out of touch with the public? Do Australian universities fulfill the same role of public good provision as, many, as much as they do in China as presented today? Um, yeah, I think we've got a real problem in Australia with the um, government's uh, attitude towards towards universities and I think to some extent universities have, have themselves to blame a little bit for that. 
Um, certainly with uh, the government's policies at the moment around the job graduate, job ready graduate uh, funding and fee reforms and the unwillingness or the changing of the moving of the goalposts with regard to the job keeper scheme has not helped universities at all. Clearly the um, reductions in student international student income is going to not just affect uh, teaching and learning but also research as well because a lot of that money went as a discretionary uh, expenditure on research so we've got a whole host of problems um, across universities and higher education generally in Australia which the government is not going to be help, very helpful with so we need to sort ourselves out to some extent um, and uh, also at the same time build a better reputation I think on, amongst the public opinion the reputation of universities is pretty high and the reputation of individual academics is pretty high, but amongst the government, um, it's, it's not. And the government does seem to be using the COVID crisis as an opportunity to, to, re to reduce uh, the university sector. I think it probably doesn't worry too much about voters because it doesn't expect to have many voters in amongst the university staff and students. So uh, it is being a little bit opportunist, opportunist in, this, uh, in this time. Simon. Yeah, um, thanks, William, and I, and I agree with that. And, uh, and, and we have to ask ourselves why, you know, why is the Australian government at this time so hostile? Um, it doesn't make sense. It's the Australian government, by refusing to, to prop up and subsidise the universities through what is an enormous crisis, loss of most of their international students, quarter of their income comes from international education. That's a big chunk. You know, why isn't the Australian government protecting the international education industry, which is a, a very big export earner? And why isn't it protecting universities to sustain the science base? Because unique among the major science countries, Australia finances more than half of its science from its own earnings and mostly in the international student market. So why isn't the government coming to the party at this point? Why is it allowing the both the export industry and the science base, which is a public good, to wither in this way. It makes no sense if you think that a conservative government should be pursuing a neoliberal agenda. It doesn't make sense, but it becomes explicable when you realize that the Australian government is not so much a British conservative type of conservatism in this sector. It's more like the Republican party in the United States and the view of the, and, and the liberal national parties are influenced by the Republican playbook. Uh, in a lot of areas at the moment. And the Republican Party's view is that the universities are hostile ideological opponents of them, of themselves as, re as Republicans, that the universities are hotbeds of liberalism in the American sense, that the, 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 only, the only good lies in breaking their social, cultural, political, and economic power. And the best way to weaken the universities in Australia right now is to refuse to compensate them the loss of this massive amount of international education revenue. No other country in the world would have a very strong science system and then would deconstruct it in this way. Every other country is trying to build science. Well, thank you, Simon. Um, and I think actually that's probably, do you, do you want to add in terms of any other concluding remarks? Because like this brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you all for your questions. Um, they're being great, and I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to address all of them in the time available. Um, but um, I'm sure we can communicate privately um, outside of the of the webinar um, um, if you want to pursue issues. So thank you so much for joining. Um, Simon, are there any concluding comments that you want to make, or William? Let me say thank you to you, Claire, for your wonderful chairing today and for your uh, wonderful participation as a as a co-editor with along with myself and William and thank you to William as well. Thank you William for mounting today's uh, webinar which has been a fun exercise for all of us and I hope uh, the participant um, uh, audience has also enjoyed it. Um, so and we look forward to the next book and the next discussion. Thanks to all.